computacional, tá? Então, eles vão falar hoje um pouco de uh, em simbologia em si. O Dr. Linus, if I pronounce wrong your last name, please uh, correct me. Johansen, uh, uh, ele é pesquisador do Manchester Institute of Biotechnology e ele é pesquisador na área de também na área de química computacional, eles têm experiência em imunologia, eles têm experiência em dinâmica molecular e também em densidade funcional teórica. Tá? Então, eles vão fazer uma apresentação para a gente. Né? Então, uh, generally, you, you both do the presentation, then we discuss the question. Você está aberto o som, estou falando para sem som. Tá, tava mutado. Mas ele vai ficar dando microfonia, né? Pronto? Então, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. That's okay. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Thank you very much uh, to be here. Okay. Thanks. So sorry, we have to switch to English now. <laughs> I, I tried to speak slowly, but if you need me to, to repeat, just wave your hand. Um, so firstly, thank you to Professor Sagato for the invitation and for, for hosting our visit. Uh, you for coming today. So, Minus and I will talk about some of the work we do in Manchester, and I've, I've called it in silico enzymology. So, how we use uh, computers to study enzymes, but also we always. And if we're studying enzymes, usually the first thing we're interested in is kinetics or activity. So how good is the enzyme? How fast is the reaction? What substrates does the enzyme use? And so we are really interested in this from a very fundamental aspect because enzymes are usually the best catalysts that we have. So we work with chemists that make molecules, and sometimes they make catalysts, and Lots almost always enzymes are much, much better. So a lot of the work that Linus and I do is very fundamental. We want to know how the enzyme is so good at catalyzing this reaction. But also many of the enzymes we work with are useful, so we use them for colleagues, collaborators, 
use them for much more applied work. So much more like some of the work that we can do here. So if we start with kinetics, some of you may have used uh, or mentioned kinetics for enzymes. The standard method is, is Michaelis Minton, where you measure initial velocity. We also use uh, more complicated methods to measure more detailed kinetics, so uh, rapid mixing, stopped flow. Uh, and sometimes we need these because some of the enzymes we study have very complicated reactions. So they have many steps, and if we want to understand how the enzyme works, we need to try to understand each step in the reaction. And often that's impossible to do just with experiments. So we need to use computation as well to study the things that we can't see experiments do. Um, the other thing that we know is that enzymes move a lot. So if you have an enzyme uh, in the active site, the substrate binds, you may have a loop or a, a domain that opens and closes to allow the substrate to bind. And often this is important in understanding how the enzyme works. And if you want to engineer, to make mutants, to change activity or to improve, then you sometimes need to understand all of these motions. And this is where computation is good, because crystallography just captures one single structure. So we use computation, we use molecular dynamics simulations to, to look at those dynamics. Um, but we can use computers for lots. We can model structure, we can model kinetics, you can model the reaction mechanism. Um, and always we're trying to explain experiment or predict uh, properties or experiments that would be good to, to help us understand the enzymes. So that, as a computational chemist, is the best. If we can make a prediction, and the experimentalist goes in the instead of the 100, and we're right, which does particularly like them because the flavin cofactor changes color depending on the redox state. So when they are oxidized, they are yellow. When they are one electron reduced, they may be colorless or, or red. And when they're two electron reduced, they're colorless, maybe a little blue. So we can follow the reaction very easily by measuring absorbance. Um, and yeah, as I said, we also like them because we can understand them uh, and then teach the enzyme engineers how to improve them, maybe to change the, the reaction they catalyze or to make them more robust, higher temperature or, or other reaction properties. Um, so we can also study them using computational methods. So we can study the individual reactions of these enzymes and I won't talk in too much detail because I think, does anybody have any experience of doing computational chemistry? No. So the, the main point is we, we can model in detail using quantum chemistry the individual steps of the reaction. So that allows us to get lots of detail about the individual reaction. And the, when it works well, we get good agreement between computer kinetics or rate constants and experimental. So that doesn't always work well, but when it does work, we can get really good answers. And so this is one example where we've got them almost perfect. Um, 
The other thing we, we do, so who works on an enzyme and you've made a mutant? I know a few of you. So when we start to study these, we make mutations in the gene, we make proteins that have different amino acids, sometimes in the active site or sometimes in the elsewhere. And when we start to study these, if we use these, these detailed me uh, measurements, we can start to see lots of information that we, we couldn't see before. And it starts to uncover problems that we can, we can cause by making uh, mutants or studying enzymes under the wrong conditions. So in this case, we end up with a series of enzymes where the substrate doesn't bind properly and it kind of binds in different positions in the active site. And when it does, we get reactions at different uh, with different rate constants that make the kinetics complicated. Um, and if you're using an enzyme to do uh, chiral chemistry, maybe for making drugs, this is a big problem because it can scramble your chiral sensors. But we can use a mixture of steady state and stop flow kinetics and computational chemistry. Again, this is with some molecular dynamics and some kinetic models. We could start to understand what, what the problem was. In this case, we don't know how to fix, but we can say, if you make mutants, you need to be careful in how you interpret the data. So this is an example of that. The other thing we can do is study on very, very fast time scales, uh, how these interact with light. So flavins are light active. If you shine light on a flavin, uh, because they're yellow and they're oxidized, you can do photochemistry. So there's now a big um, uh, uh, well, it's become a, what we call a hot topic. There's a number of research groups pushing very hard to do uh, novel chemistry with, with photo-activated or excited flavonoids. So these NDs, OYEs, uh, are, are getting used a lot to catalyze new types of chemistry that only works when you shine light. Okay? So in a country like Brazil with lots of sunlight, these sorts of enzymes may become more important in the future. For now, this is slowly a very small scale in the lab. But for us to understand what's going on, we can use uh, ultra-fast spectroscopy, where we use a laser to excite very quickly, and we follow over picoseconds or nanoseconds uh, the, the photochemistry of, of the flavor and the enzyme. And we can construct cycles that describe all of these connectors. So we can generate lots of beautiful data and get lots of detailed information about that enzyme. Um, we can also then use computation to understand what we look at. So we can use quantum methods again to study energy levels in the orbitals in the active site to understand what we see on different time scales. Um, and ultimately, the reason we are doing this in Manchester is because we know the, these light reactions are very inefficient. So only a very small percentage of the reaction happens. So mostly we shine light and then nothing happens. So this is trying to uh, to understand how we improve this. So one day maybe we can use in industry. Um, so that's the first example. The second one is a different class of enzyme but also with a cofactor. So these are reductive dehydrogenases. So these are important because we think we can use these for bioremediation. So these break carbon hydrogen, carbon hydrogen, uh, carbon or chlorine or fluorine or bromine bonds. So if you have a, a raincoat with a waterproof coating, a lot of these will have uh, halogenated compounds in them. And as they slowly get released into the environment, we are now getting bacteria evolving that can, can eat these compounds. And one of the enzymes responsible is these enzymes. Um, so I was working with some X-ray crystallographers with this project, um, and they got some beautiful crystal data they couldn't understand. So what they found was that the halogenated compounds 
bite it in the enzyme active site, as we expect, but have a, a, a new type of interaction with the. So this is a the cofactor is a coenzyme B12, a ballerin. And as a chemist, we got very excited because this is a, a new kind of chemical bond between a cobalt and the vitamin B12 and the halogen in these substrates. So we had to do a lot of work with computational chemistry to prove that this was a real interaction or bond and to understand how this worked because this is, we think, uh, key to how the, the enzyme catalyzes this reaction. So this is a mixture of X-ray crystallography and uh, a mixture of computational chemistry methods. Um, and we can uh, use, again, quantum chemistry. We don't need to know the detail. But we can do things like compute the, the orbitals, where the electrons in these bonds are. And we can see what happens when we oxidize or reduce the cobalt. We can look at how the electron density rates. And we can construct a mechanism explain how the enzyme works, which fits with the experiment. And we can explain why some substrates work and other substrates are inhibited because they don't work. And we can also look from the active site where the amino acids interact with the substrate to say, well, if you mutate this one to a different residue, maybe you can bind a different substrate and make the enzyme better. So the third class of enzymes that I was going to briefly talk about, so this is a bit more related to the work that Linus does, uh, do methyl transfer. So they use a, a substrate called uh, SAM. So I have to work on them a little bit. So this is a, a denosyl methionine. So it is a biology's methyl transfer cofactor. And in this case, um, the enzyme we're interested in is called COMT. So, if anybody knows somebody with Parkinson's disease, the, the shaky disease, COMT is one of the drug targets. So, people with don't have the Parkinson's take an inhibitor of this enzyme because it stops uh, dopamine being metabolized. We like the enzyme because it's a good system to understand how biology does methyl transfer. So again, we study this using to model using computation. So Linus can run molecular dynamics simulations and see if these agree with, with our NMR. And this tells us how the enzyme
a natural love in the box. So um, it has a, a horrible long name, but we call it for. And it catalyzes um, a reaction that uh, is involved in the, the biosynthesis of chlorophyll. So it's reducing a double bond in the, the ring system. So there's a dark uh, or a non photoactive type of enzyme that uses ATP, so very expensive for the cell. Uh, and a light activator for this one. It doesn't require ATP, but it does require uh, visible light, which is not such a problem if you're in the leaf of the plant because you wait, you don't want to make chlorophyll until the sun comes out, but once it does, the enzyme turns on and it can make chlorophyll. But we like because it's light activated, so that means all of those ex uh, spectroscopies where we use lasers can be used to study the reaction. Um, and we can also use computational chemistry to understand the enzyme because it was very difficult to get structures. So we got X-ray crystal structures um, of the enzyme one substrate, but not the other. So this is a, a movie showing Linus using computational methods to build a, a model of the, the ternary complex, the, the reactive complex. Okay. And you can see. It's quite a complicated series of movements for that substrate to bind. We can also do some fancy quantum chemistry to study the reaction. So in this case, there is a hydride transfer that we think occurs stepwise. Chemists get excited by this, but biologists, it's not so important. Um, but what is maybe more useful to the plant bioscientists is we can also use modeling to model dimers and oligomers of the protein, which seem to be important in formation of, uh, of uh, prolomellar bodies, so one of the uh, precursors to, to the photosynthetic complexes. Uh, so we're using a whole range of methods from fancy quantum chemistry and, and experimental X-ray crystallography, some modeling, to go all the way from light exciting our enzyme through to protein aggregating and then coming apart in order to, um, well, ultimately allow leaf uh, or photosynthesis to occur in leaves. So a whole range of experiments and, and computational chemistry in order to understand this process. So that's where I stop and let Linus start. So essentially the the message we have, and we believe in Manchester, the best way to study enzymes, if you want to know the detail of how they work, is to use a whole range of methods. Lots of experiments, lots of computational chemistry. Um, you need to be a little careful about the enzymes you work on. Some of them are just difficult. And you need to have good collaborators. So it's always nice to come to, to sunny places and work with collaborators <laughs> to, to find new enzymes to study. So, um, this is some of the people involved in, in the work and some of the funders. Um, but with that, thank you for listening. I'll sit down and Linus will explain in more detail how we do some of this computational work. So that if any of you are interested in the future, you know what will be involved. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Linus, and uh, my job title is uh, Senior Technical Specialist in Computational Chemistry. And what that means is that my job is basically to help uh, other groups across the, the department, um, especially computational groups, uh, do modeling. So sometimes people come to me and they'll say, we have some data, we have some means, we have some kinetics, or we have a protein structure, but we don't know how the protein works, or how the enzyme works. 
um, any help in the um, So that's generally about the job. Um, so today, uh, this presentation is designed as a very brief, uh, practical introduction to how you would do some deep modeling techniques. So specifically, uh, homology modeling, molecular docking, and molecular dynamics. Um, so these talks are going to be as colorful as sounds. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, detail, step by step, how we can use them. Um, so really, the idea is that in your own time, you can you can uh, use this presentation, you can use these slides, and uh, try and work through some of these things. If you're interested in doing some of these uh, modeling techniques, then great. Uh, if not, then maybe have a 15 minutes siesta. Uh, uh, so yeah, if you would like a copy of these slides, uh, please send me any help. Uh, but first, I just want to do a very quick uh, summary or uh, introduction to uh, experimental structural determinations of structural biology. Uh, because I think it's important to remember that uh, when you do an experiment, and, and you, get, you get a nice crystal structure at the end, you get a nice really structure of your protein or enzyme, um, the experiment doesn't give you that 3D structure. The experiment gives you something that looks much more abstract, like this mixture of diffraction, for example. Or you might get into Mars, but prior to MR graphs. Um, and then you really need to do a lot of uh, data processing uh, and modeling. And that's the key thing. But even if you have an experimental structure, ultimately, it relies on a lot of modeling. So you need to do some data processing. And I've, I included data processing as a separate step. I think this is really cool. So this is one of the earliest electron density maps printed on one of the earliest computers. It's called an electronic delay storage of the manufacturer. So this is from either the early 60s or the late 50s. And that's uh, John Kendrew. Uh, that's his... Uh, uh, ...building uh, the, the world's first... Data, you get electron density, and then you can build a model that fits within that density. And sometimes it's not at all obvious uh, how to do that. Um, so, some of the limitations of these experiments uh, with crystallography obviously, you need crystals. Um, flexible regions are very hard to see, they, they can appear invisible. Um, in your crystal structure, so loops on the surface, for example, often you don't see them. And they can be crystal artifacts. So especially on the surface where, where crystals uh, different proteins uh, stack together, uh, the protein loops of one might interact between the active side of the other or something, so you get all these artifacts. Uh, NMR is great, but you're really limited to how big your protein can be. Uh, obviously, it needs to be soluble, uh, and you need high concentrations, uh, and it's uh, lower resolution than the prism. And then, finally, cryo EM is, uh, well, one of the expensive, it's difficult to do, but also it's very, very low resolution, typically, so not really good enough to build an atomic uh, resolution model. And then you have more general problems that apply to all of these, which is, uh, so you might be interested in substrate binding if you want to do chemistry. Um, it can be very difficult to get anything at all in your active site, but even if you can get something in your active site, in your model, uh, in, your, in your structure, uh, substrates are very hard because what happens is when you bind the substrate, typically they'll react. So then you might be able to get a, a, a structure with your, your product but not your, your substrate. Um, you also have problems with uh, multiple conformations and disordered regions. Um, and so, modeling techniques can obviously help with these things. So, uh, docking can be used to try and look at how things bind on the other side. Uh, and then, MD simulations are great for looking at things like multiple conformations or disordered regions. Uh, and, like Sam said, if there's catalytically relevant dynamics, uh, which you won't be able to see in a, in a static model, uh, MD uh, is great for that. 
Um, okay, so a lot of people mentioned. So this talk, I'm not going to go in, into detail about uh, the theory. So like I said, this is really a, a practical uh, But just briefly, uh, what is homology modeling? Well, it, it uses uh, other structures for proteins or enzymes with uh, similar sequences uh, to build a model. So the general rule of thumb is if you have something with at least 30% of its identity, you can be pretty sure that it's going to look very, very similar. Uh, again, there are uh, many limitations to this method. Obviously, you need homological structures, and that can be uh, a problem. Uh, and again, just as for the experimental uh, stuff, substrate binding, multiple confirmation disorder regions, uh, you know, homology model can't really deal with those. Um, and of course, there are many, many techniques, uh, computational tools for doing homology modeling. So I've just named a few there. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of AlphaFold. Um, obviously, that's the, the, the best method uh, available today. Uh, before AlphaFold, I thought of ICAPSER, so the third one there. Uh, for me, that was the best one. Uh, but nowadays, of course, if you want to try modeling, modeling, I recommend AlphaFold. Uh, but if you are interested in ICAPSER, uh, very easy to use. Web Web server, you just paste your sequence. Uh, you do have to register, but it's free. Uh, and you just click run. It's slow, it takes a few days to get results, but it is pretty good. Um, although not as good as AlphaFold. So, again, when it's AlphaFold, you can install it yourself, uh, but then it's really slow unless you have a really good computer cluster. But you can use CloudFold, which is um, uses. The internet to do the calculations. Um, so if you go to the Collabfold website, it opens this, this Jupyter notebook. So Jupyter notebook is just a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an editor for writing Python scripts and allows you to run Python scripts. So this uh, has the, the Python script that runs off the fold, opens on that. You just paste your sequence. Paste the sequence there, and you click the top, the runtime run, uh, and then it'll run in the background. Once it's done, you can save your results. So, just a very quick example. So, this is a, an LPMO that uh, Fernando was uh, interested in us uh, working on. Um, so, one of our students, Chris, uh, who he was supposed to come with us on this trip, but um, but he started working on this, so he's done some, some homology models. And here, I just wanted to show uh, one of the things about homology modeling, which is about intrinsically disordered regions. Uh, so these LPMOs have uh, an extended C terminus uh, disordered region. And basically, homology modeling doesn't work well. So if you look first at AlphaFold on the right, you'll see that this core region here is very well defined because there's a lot of homologies uh, in, the, in the PDB. Uh, and then this bit here is quite, uh, it's quite um, accurate, or it's, quite, um, it's got high confidence of. But in between, it just says, I don't know, I give up. I'm just going to connect these two ends. And, um, and ICASR, maybe you think it looks a bit better, uh, but actually ICASR, uh, it's, it's really isn't it better. If you look, for example, uh, this region here, it looks a little bit like an alpha helix, but it's, it's not an alpha helix. So it's just, that's just high class of saying, I don't know, I'm just going to make a random guess. Um, the good thing about high class it does uh, some quality control. So when you, when you get your model, it gives you these C scores and TM scores, and basically tells you which regions of the protein that it's. Uh, it's very confident about, so you can see that, okay, it doesn't know what's going on. Um, Alright, let's move on to docking. So what is docking? So docking is where you use a force field to try and put a, a ligand or a cofactor or whatever into a, a, a binding point. And what is a force field? A force field is just 
a set of parameters which describe uh, all the atoms in your system as um, using simple equations, and it describes their the bonded and non bonded interactions uh, so that you can use, for example, columbic um, interactions to work out where things, uh, where, where the cofactors are. Uh, again, there's lots of methods. So, uh, Swiss Doc is an online uh, tool, very easy to use. Uh, Autodoc Bina is great, uh, but it does require that you install it yourself and you do a lot of pre processing, so it can be a bit tricky. Uh, but CV Doc is also quite good, and that actually uses Autodoc Bina. So if you want to use uh, an experiment with docking and you want to try Bina, then CV Doc is a good place to start. It also has the advantage that it, it tries to identify binding points. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, very straightforward. You just paste your sequence here. Uh, uh, sorry, your PDB file, um, and then you put your ligand. And if you don't have a 3D structure of your ligand, it even lets you uh, draw your ligand. If you click there, and that's essentially all there's to Now, if you do want to use Octo Bina, uh, I've got here all the steps that you need to use. Uh, but like I said, it does involve downloading some software and uh, running it on your uh, computer or on your cluster. So I'm not going to go through all the details here because I think that would be uh, just really boring. Um, but so yeah, if you, if you send me send me an email, then I will happily uh, send you this file. And if in the next few days you want to ask me questions about this, or or you can send me an email if you have questions. That works too. Uh, but I just want to give you a quick example uh, of um, uh, well, a successful example, a possible also unsuccessful example. Um, so this was a case where there, we had a, a, an engineer enzyme uh, which carries out a reaction which uh, doesn't occur in nature. And what it does is it needs to form a bond between this histidine and this cyclohexion. And that allows this to form a bond between this cyclohexane and this aldehyde. Uh, and that's essentially the, the goal of this, uh, uh, this reaction is to form this bond. So we docked these two ligands separately, and we were able to uh, uh, get really good uh, results. So what we can see is that it binds perfectly uh, for the formation of those two bonds. Um, obviously, it doesn't always work this well, so we have a, more recently, we tried a, a newer version of this enzyme that works uh, on slightly different substrates, and we just couldn't get it to, the docking just did not work very well. We have to use a, a different type of docking where you can, you can specify that these two, you can specify that you know, these two atoms need to be close to each other, and then we were able to get a reasonable docking. Um, so it doesn't always work, but when it does, it's really nice. Uh, and finally, one of the dynamic simulations. Uh, so in these simulations, uh, we use, again, force field uh, to see how things move uh, when you apply heat, essentially. So you use a force field, and, you, and the program solves the, the laws of motion, or a simplified version. Again, there's lots of different programs you could use. Char, Lambert, Bromax are some of the most popular. Uh, there's a very nice Bromax tutorial, so if you do want to try this, then that's a great place to start. Um, but again, um, I use a slightly different method than we use uh, in the Bromax tutorial because the tutorial doesn't tell you how you deal with your ligand. So if you have a ligand that the force field doesn't know about, then you have to do what's called parametrization. You have to tell the force field, what is this molecule, and what do I do with it? But Amber has a really good um, program with it that allows you to do parametrization quite easily. Um, they use another program called t lead to, uh, to prepare your whole system. Um, and then, so now you have Amber, Files which you then convert to Chromex and run Chromex. 
Again, I don't want to go into the details. Um, so here I've got step-by-step -step instructions on what to do. Here is uh, one of the input files you will need. You can just play around with that in your own time. Um, and again, I'll explain, explain what the file does. So hopefully, when you look at this, you can, it makes sense. Uh, and then, yeah, this file here which converts your Amber file to Chrome Apps. Uh, hopefully, it will make sense once you look at it yourself. Um, so just a very quick example. Um, uh, again, the same LP mode before. So we started with the uh, AlphaFold model that Chris had made. Um, and then the first step when you do dynamics is to do something called energy minimization. And that's just trying to get the, the, the protein that described using the force limit. And straight away you can see that the this loop that uh, AlphaFold doesn't know what to do with. It's clearly unstable the way AlphaFold drew it. And so it starts to fold in on itself. And then when you run the MD, it, it folds very quickly. Um, obviously, what we get there after 15 nanoseconds of MD is probably not you know, correct. Um, it's, it's obviously a difficult problem to get uh, a good fold for this. Uh, but this is just to show you how quickly you know things can change during the And that's actually uh, everything uh, that I want to cover today. Thank you very much for listening. And again, I just want to reiterate that if you would like to copy this slide, please send me an email. And if there's if you have any further questions or if you'd like some help with any of these things over the next few days, uh, please come to me. Ah, antes de vocês ir embora, eu queria depois tirar uma foto aqui com os professores, tá? So, questions? Uh, professor Sam also habla poquito espanhol. <laughs> If you are shy to ask in, in English, you ask in Portuguese I will, or in Spanish, I will try to translate to them. I have some questions, but that's them first. Thank you for the presentation. And about the structure, uh, Fernando's uh, protein, the loop is kind of a trick to verify because it's actually when we take the crystal, the loop is very stable and, 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 and it's a problem to, to have the real structure. Yeah. So how can you solve this problem? Um, I think we don't really know. Well. <laughs> So if you want to, if you solve this enzyme structure, if it worked, you'd see this part. So this part you might see in your structure. If well, however the other bit is, shakes around, you don't see it. But at least it tells you what the core of the protein looks like. So if you look in the protein data bank where all of the protein crystal structures are deposited and stored, you see lots of proteins missing with these loops. Now, Not so many with such big loops as this one. But if you know what where the start and the end of the loop is, then modeling in the one to join them is easier. So if this one, if the helix at the end is visible in your core, then at least it gives you some clues about how to link them. But yeah, otherwise NMR will tell you more because it can see uh, dynamics, but solving a structure from NMR is difficult. So especially if it's moving a lot, you probably can't. So yeah, I think what this intrinsically disordered or dynamic region looks like, best tool is probably minus. So yeah. But I don't know, it's an interesting problem that we would like to look at more because clearly it does something or else biology evolution will got rid of it. So it's, it must be useful. Yeah. See? Thanks for an interesting presentation. Thank you for that. But remember in Portuguese, you have a question in Portuguese. É, em questão de é, parâmetros de qualidade, 
o que é necessário, o que é mais interessante de se olhar, e se eles usam o Lama Shandam, plot, para qualidade, e se tem threshold de Armstrongs, que são, é, dizer, até aqui está boa a estrutura, passou daqui está ruim. Threshold do Armstrong tem. Tem. Eu só lembro para lembrar tudo. Eu acho que você precisa checar a qualidade. Você precisa checar a a If the structure is not so good, we can run molecular dynamics. And if the simulation becomes stable, then maybe we try a few in, in parallel. And if we always get the same structure at the end, we usually say it's okay. Um, if the structure is Well, if we can't get a stable molecular dynamics simulation, so by stable we can we can measure like the change in structure over time, then then we say, well, either the MD parameters, the force field is no good, or the starting structure is not right. Um, is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we probably don't often look around the camera plots. The textbook says it's super important, and I think for us understanding, uh, like the kind of typical types of secondary structure of proteins, it's, it's helpful. But if you have a dynamic loop, or if you have something strange in your active site, you might have a residue or residues that that don't sit in the normal parts. So that that's good to look because it tells you that there's something different about those amino acids, but it doesn't always mean it's wrong. Uh, but I don't know, when did you last look at a, probably a long time ago, right? Yeah, during my master's. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. I mean, I think different groups will have different methods for, for quality control, um, and there's nothing wrong with checking. Some of these online web servers will give you a Ramakandian plot for your predicted, so for homology models and things. But yeah, if you look at enzymes, sometimes they break the rules. They do just funny things because they they have to in order to do the reaction. Told you we can understand. Yeah, more questions. Yeah, yeah. 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 Possible, yeah. Um, I mean, how good is it? I don't really know. I've never really done uh, talking with big molecules. Is it is it a polysaccharide you're interested in, or is it different? It's polysaccharide. So there is a method, a specific docking uh, algorithm for docking polysaccharides. So we tried this again. So I can't remember the name, but I can find it for you if you're interested. Now, how good the result is, the problem is there are not so many uh, structures with a complex of a protein in the polysaccharide. So we only know what, I guess, the really rigid ones look like. Uh, so the force field is just a series of rules that say how to uh, estimate the energy or the, the, the goodness of the docking. Uh, and if they don't know what most of the docking of the binding looks like, then they might be not super accurate. But there are ways of generating structures. And again, if you do this, and then, so we did with heparin sulfate, because uh, we had a, an end, well, a protein that bound, bound heparin sulfate. So we used docking and then molecular dynamics. 
to see whether it was stable. And sometimes it stays bound, and sometimes they go. But yeah, if you're interested, I can find you the, the docking method, because there is one somewhere that has been developed for this. Yeah, it's generally always a good idea to remove the dynamic simulations after you've done docking. Yeah. Because docking, you'll never know how good it is, really. Question. I was interested. Do you uh, develop the problems, or you usually use the web tools? We haven't developed much. Uh, mostly for like analysis or system preparation, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, to tools to help us run the software. Yeah, I mean, generally. What we're not good at is making a nice website, and uh, so mostly when we develop things, it's very uh, like command line web yeah, okay. And so if you look at uh, the reports of information, sometimes you find lots of code, but never, you know, a nice pretty. Because it's it's hard to get funding to make the, the website or the, you know, the software, uh, and usually the student finishes and goes and get a job, and so we can't get them to, to do that. It's something that, well, we're always grateful for people to do, um, and it's probably something we should look at more, but we just need to find a, a way that it does it better. Um, but if you're interested in, in uh, being highly cited, people that do their software get a lot of citations. So, you know, they get rewards in that way. But, uh, yeah. 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 So the question is from Matheus. Matheus is, well, actually he's a PhD student in our group. Yeah. So he's apologizing because he unfortunately could uh, be here. And he starts as a funny question because he asked for Professor Hay. Uh, good afternoon to Professor Hay and to Dr. Professor Sen and to Dr. Hay. Uh, <laughs> Professor Sam Hay and Dr. Linus yeah. Johannes and Matheus. But, but yes, I, I couldn't keep with you, Matheus. He's asking as classical DM, is there a force field capable of parametizing IDPs and IDRs? Thanks, Matheus. Sorry for the. Yeah, so, so some of the. The protein force fields like amber and charm, they have, and Gromax have force fields for proteins. And some of them work better for IDPs than others, but when we do calculations, we can make a structure or calculate something, and then we need to do something called benchmarking. So there must be a Portuguese name for this too. But benchmarking is when we can get an experiment. And if we don't benchmark, we don't actually know how good. So if we can predict the structure and then a crystallographer comes and solves it, we can compare. And if they, you know, agree, then we did a good job. And that's how we know alpha fold two works, because they predicted a bunch of structures that then the experimentalist provided and they compared them and it was like, well, this works better than everything else. Now for IDPs, the problem is we don't really have physical data for benchmarking. So nobody really knows how good some of them are. So the best data is probably MMR because it has more chance of seeing these dynamic structures. But the, the, the data is kind of low resolution. So we don't, we don't have like a structure, we just have some, some clues. The IDPs, if they have prolines or cysteines, so if you form, proline has to, to isomerize, and that is super slow. And cysteines can form disulfide linkages. So if you have either of those in your IDP, it causes a massive headache for the computation of chemists because we have to run every combination in order to sample. And so we have done a little bit of work, but it's students hate it because it's like lots of simulations, and then you never really know which ones are correct. So I don't think you've done any more than that either, have you? No. The, the, the interesting thing about parameters and IDPs is that uh, and the amber force field, especially, it really favors alpha helices. 
so if you don't want alpha helices in your IDP, then you might be biasing it towards more alpha helices. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a real problem. There are actually funny force fields made for IDPs, which are wrong. So they make the barrier for uh, cis transverse polarization of the proline too low. And what that means is during the simulation, it flips much more quickly than it should. So we know that the kinetics are total garbage of all, but it allows more sampling. So there are special IDP force fields, but they're there to do special, special tricks. So you have to understand why or what they do to, to understand the results. So yeah, if we want to study this, this protein and come up with a, a, a computational model of the, the whole protein, we'd need to do lots and lots of simulations so run for much longer than 50 nanoseconds and run lots of different ones with different force fields. And if they all give the same, or if some of them give the same results, then we can say this is our best guess. But at the moment, we know that it does something, but we don't know yet what it is. Okay, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, we know it doesn't look like the one Yeah. <laughs> more questions? Should we my turn? Yeah, I, I have some questions because we are using the karyotic season to protein, all the protein expression. And generally, we are expressing, as you are modeling, a uh, karyotic protein. For example, this, this protein is a sponsored in the Gales, and it has around 15 glycosylation sites, yeah. mainly in the, uh, the linker. So, well, I know it's hard to, well, uh, we have tried to crystallize without removing the glycosylation, but sometimes we have luck, but generally it does not happen. But sometimes it happens, so how trustable um, or how different these structures can be if you, because I know you can add uh, manually or computationally the glycosylation, but even the UAD will not be the same that you are looking for, that are abetted by the cell, right? Yeah. The biological system. So, can, for example, if we have a crystal structure for this protein with the glycosylation, we had a totally different reason. Yeah. In gen model, with MD, Glycosylation or other post translational modification. But mm, like almost all MD work is done without. So if you make your protein in E. coli, yeah, I know. But of course it's not it's not realistic for, for plants to carry it. So so for example, who do we So if 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 you can tell me which residue has what uh, modification, uh -huh. then we can model. But yeah. the problem is, you say it's this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, and it's like a mixture of... Yes, and, and we, we should know exactly the, the branch of sugar, yes. the size of and the branch. And of course, the protein won't be all exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But so for, for example, if, if we cut the linker in the disorder region, and get the result of the structure, and get the diffraction, and solve the structure, and then use another techniques to try to get this glycosylation like in MR or cryo -ADM. Is it possible? Yeah, we can model it. It's not so much more difficult, it's just because nobody really knows exactly what the glycosylation is, we tend to ignore it. But it's starting to become more common for people to employ. So some of the COVID work done by MD, okay. they started putting the modifications back because it was super important for antibody binding. So I think now in the last three or four years, it's starting to become more and more, more common. And it's something we should do because whenever you have proteins that are glycosylated or phosphorylated or whatever, you know, really we should be modeling them properly. So yeah, if uh, I don't think that the computational community has already decided what the best way to do it is. It's just been like ignored. Um, 
but now I think we need to do better. The, 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 the less, oh, I have some points, but it's not, now it's not important. We can discuss after. But just today, know how important it is you validate computational data with biochemical data. Well, reviewers say it's always important. Yeah. Sometimes it's not possible. Because you can go in both ways. Yeah. Start with computational modeling and validate by biochemical and get biochemical results and validate with computational. Yeah, so people trust experiment. They don't trust computation. So yeah. usually computation we need to benchmark, we need to compare with experiment. Yeah. I think um, because sometimes experiments They are not so easy to do. Well, and sometimes, yeah, so sometimes it's not possible. Okay, so there are some things we can compute that you can't do an experiment to test. So if we compute like an electron density of a, an orbital, nobody can do the experiment to, to, to benchmark. But for the stuff that can be validated by experiment, we normally try to. Or we make a prediction that says, we think if you make this mutation or try this substrate or whatever, then this will happen. Because then at least, if our prediction comes true, then our model is probably right. Well, we have uh, here in the department, many, many people who work with uh, secondary metabolites. Yeah. So how possible is to, if you identify a secondary metabolite to perform molecular dynamics or molecular docking to check targets that, yeah. that secondary metabolites can act. It's too much information, right? So yeah, if you, if you want to know how it's made, then some tools or well, there are methods we can use to try to guess what enzyme makes it. But if you have a molecule that might bind to something, trying to predict what protein in the cell mm -hmm. the target is, is hard. Because in principle, you have to screen all of them. So we could do that. Nobody's done like a computational library of the whole proteins in a, in a cell that you could then just do docking with. Yeah. But it would be possible. Um, but you'll get lots of noise, lots of false things, lots of negative. So uh, it, it, I guess what it might do is allow you to try, you know, try these targets. Um, but it. I think it's because it's such a big job, nobody's really mm -hmm. tried it before. You'd have to have a pretty brave set of students mm -hmm. to do, do this whole thing. Uh, but now it maybe is possible. Um, but you know, if it's a eukaryotic cell, you probably need to make all your structures and your proteins yeah, properly, uh, you know, post translation uh, and Maybe the map first is where it is, the uh, double light is, is directing. Some, yeah. some pathways in the cell. So I think what what's more common is is using experimental screening where you do mm -hmm. fragment screening yes. or whatever like, against as many proteins as you can. Um, but yeah, computationally it's not impossible but it's like it's not far from. Um, but you know, with enough time and resource I guess we can try something. It would be a an awfully big project, but, uh, yeah. In terms of benchmarking, I'm just going to say, sometimes it goes the other way as well. So sometimes you compare with experiment, and mm -hmm. you say, your experiment doesn't make sense of these results. Okay. It's not, I, I, I don't understand how this can work. Uh -huh. and then you have a big argument, big back and forth, and then they say, oh yeah, we must have measured something different. Oh yeah, this, so we've, we've had a case where you know, they, they say, this is the, this species, this is the, the, this is immediate. Uh -huh. Yeah, we model it; it doesn't work. And then after a while, it's like, oh yeah, we must have, we must have become another intermediate along yeah. the way. Oh, then it makes sense. That, okay, that, that, that's interesting because you show that there are you know, structures modeled by cancer and they're not for the, they are completely different. Yeah. Well, that that one <coughs> five fifty eight milliseconds. Yeah. It looks like more than that from my class here. Uh, a little more. Yeah, but we have, yeah, compared to the details, I'm sure it's yeah. very different.
Okay. No, so I'm, I'm asking because the first time when we modeled it, we used that tensor, and the desired regions were closest to the, the catalytic domain. So we, after, tried the uh, cellulose dehydrogenase, and the cellulose dehydrogenase coupled to, to the uh, region that were folded close to the catalytic domain. Then we remove this sort of region and we are checking and the time started to work better. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Maybe after we can yeah, yeah, yeah. discuss a little bit. Yeah, I think we can, can, can help more in this, to understand this, this, this region. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you need to ask a question. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Experimentos de bancada, a gente tem a revisão por pares, geralmente o revisor é alguém da bancada que consegue entender aquilo e, e por exemplo, falar se tem um erro ou não. E o experimento computacional, alguém revisa o código? Porque pode ter um erro no código que gera uma proteína que não existe, mas que está como certo. Traduz ela. Sim, ele está perguntando porque se você faz experimentos, então quando você submit um artigo, você vai ter os reviewers. Yeah. So if you submit uh, an article that you only use computational tools, so if, if there is any people that can check if the code that you use to model oh, that. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we do publish papers that are purely computational. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, in terms of the code, we use programs that are well established. So they've been, but the, the programs themselves have been benchmarked. Before, so Gromax and benchmark before. Or if, if you do DFT calculations, QF calculations, then we use Gaussian, which has been benchmarked many times. So from that perspective, yeah, it's fine. But then, yeah, typically then we will, even though it's a purely computational paper, we try and at least compare with previous experiments that we've done in the past. So you always try and at least have as much as possible comparison with, with experiment. But also, we had to include a lot of the data in supporting information. So for for any quantum chemistry, all of the structures and energies are all in the in the supporting information. So if somebody wants to repeat our works in the future, they can go and, and take the structure or you know see if they can get the same energy. So they can check that the calculation that they do, do agrees with the one that we read in that paper. Um, for MD, we don't tend to so much because the files are really big. Um, but we need to get better at working out how to do that, I think, as a community. And normally, if we can publish a paper with experimentalists, so we have some experiment and some theory, then the paper, we get into a better journal. So this is a good trick if you can to, to publish well. OK. Well, Professor Sam and Dr. Linus, not Professor Sen and Dr. Hey, we'll be sorry, Matheus. Uh, bom, eles vão estar uh, por aí. Então, se vocês quiserem depois fazer alguma pergunta para eles, vocês podem ir lá uh, levar um cafezinho para eles. eles, eles tá bom? Então, quero, I would like to thank you again. It was a pleasure to have you here. Very interesting stuff that we, at least our group, has a lot of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh,